Welcome, my name is Becky from the Seasonal Homestead. I'm going to be sharing five of our favorite summer dinners for using fresh garden vegetables that are in season. I know from experience, it can be difficult to know how to utilize all the produce coming out of the garden, or even if you're getting it from a farmer's market. So I hope this gives you some new ideas. Most of the recipes, they can be adapted for different vegetables, and they could probably also be adapted for or different dietary needs. If you would like the specific exact recipes that I use, I do have those linked down in the video description. When I was growing up, we had two French exchange students come and live with us and they were with us for an extended period of time and they became like our family. So I have a special love for French food as well because it reminds me of them. And I have their crepe recipe, but it's for sweet crepes. So I adapted their recipe to a buckwheat crepe that could be filled with savory ingredients and eaten as a dinner. You may have noticed when I first started making this that I do grind my own buckwheat flour. It tastes a lot more fresh and I just find I like it so much better than if I were to buy the buckwheat flour already made at the store. Into the blender, I am adding eight eggs, two cups of milk, this can be dairy or non-dairy, and then a quarter cup of some kind of fat, so butter or oil will work here, one cup of buckwheat flour, one cup of all-purpose flour, three tablespoons of honey, and about a quarter teaspoon of salt. You can use all buckwheat flour if you wanted to and completely omit the all-purpose flour. I just use half buckwheat and half all-purpose flour because my family prefers the flavor of that and we also like that the end result is more pliable. After I make the batter, I like to let it sit for a little bit before I cook the crepes. We went outside and gathered some of the ingredients for the filling and I am going to be making some basil pesto. So I grabbed a bunch of basil and then we also got some cherry tomatoes and I harvested some arugula. I also grabbed some garlic that was curing at the time in the shed for making the pesto. And then the final thing that we harvested was some kale. In the past, we have used a frying pan to make our crepes with, but this last Christmas, Cam got me this crepe maker as a gift, and it works so much better. It's time to flip. When I make pesto, I really like to toast both the garlic and whatever nut I am using. To do that, I put them in a frying pan and I let them cook for a little bit until they are lightly brown. Pine nuts are what are traditionally used in pesto, but I have not used pine nuts in forever because one, they're super hard to find and two, they are very expensive. So I will usually use either pecans or I will use some walnuts. Anytime I make pesto for a dinner or a recipe, I like to make a huge batch. I will use a small amount for what we are eating immediately and then the rest goes into the freezer. The majority of our basil is preserved either through freeze drying or through making pesto. And I don't know why, but I always forget to pick a whole bunch of basil and make pesto. So it works best for me to make this big batch and freeze part of it because it forces me to put up the pesto for the winter. In addition to the pesto, another topping that we like to use is chicken. And I am using our canned diced chicken for this because it is something that is super fast and easy to make. So we heat it up on the stove top and then we separate out the chicken broth from the actual shredded chicken. Every once in a while, Cam will cook three or four whole chickens on the smoker and we will eat one for dinner and then we will freeze the additional ones. Sometimes instead of using the canned cooked chicken, we will pull out one of those whole smoked chickens from the freezer and then chop it up and use it as a topping. So once we have all of our vegetables chopped and all of the 
ingredients for the topping or filling or whatever you want to call it ready. Then we set it all out and each of us will make our own. So you put the crepe on the crepe maker to warm it back up. And I didn't show it here, but a lot of times we will do an egg wash and it's just an egg and water and you whisk that together and then you brush it on top of the crepe and it fills in all of the little holes that are there. And then we will assemble the toppings on top of that and let it all heat up. And once it's heated up, we fold it in half and then you fold it into thirds and that makes it easy to eat. The best way to do this is actually just to put the toppings on one half of the crepe and then it makes it easier to fold over. I put way too many on and I put them all over the place because it looks really cool for the video, but... In reality, you should just put it on one half and then it makes it much easier to fold over and eat. And for the grand reveal. I just came out and I need to pick some cherry tomatoes and some lemon squash for dinner. On Fridays, we make a very simple dinner. The main reason for that is Friday is the day we clean the house, and when we finish, we have a movie or a game night as a reward. My kids, they do their laundry, tidy their room, clean their bathroom and the bonus room, and then Cam and I do our own set of cleaning chores. When the kids are finished cleaning, we will check their chores to make sure that it is a job well done and then they can start movie night. So by the end of all this and all of the checking of everyone's chores, I am pretty exhausted and definitely do not want to spend hours in the kitchen on a Friday night. So on this particular Friday, I settled on making frittata for dinner which is definitely quick and easy. And an added bonus is that I knew I could use up a bunch of our overabundance of summer squash. I made up this recipe as I went along and it actually turned out surprisingly well. I've made enough recipes with summer squash to know that the best results are achieved when the summer squash is salted and then you leave it to sit for a while in a colander so that all of the moisture is drawn out. Once I coat all the squash in salt, I let it sit while I chopped the rest of the vegetables and then I assembled the ingredients. So as I assembled the frittata, I used 10 eggs, a half a cup of milk, four crushed garlic cloves, and added a half a teaspoon of salt. Then I stirred that whole thing together and I added some bacon grease to a large cast iron pan. I fried my green onions in that. Then I poured in the egg mixture, added all the sliced chopped squash and the tomatoes and I topped it with cheese. And really any kind would work here. I used feta but I think cheddar cheese probably would have been a better choice. and. Then, we, then I added some basil on top of that. It all went into the oven at 400 degrees for about 15 minutes. The only thing that would have made this better is some bacon because everything tastes better with bacon. And I didn't make it because my goal for the night was to make it easy and fast and just get it done. But overall, it was a really delicious dinner and I was happy to use up almost two pounds of squash in one dinner. We did serve it with some fresh bread and jam and then my family also likes to put salsa on top of the frittata. This next dinner is smoked pulled pork tacos with homemade tortillas and it's topped with pickled cucumbers, carrots, cilantro, arugula, and lime juice. So Cam is the real expert on smoking meats, or as he likes to say it, he has a real smoking problem. So I'm bringing him on the voiceover now to tell you what he did because I have no idea. <laughs> These pork butts are from pigs that we raised here on the farm. I'm using mustard as a binder so that the spices stay on. 
the spice rub we get is from a local restaurant. Becky was really surprised with how much spice I put on, but at the restaurant, they tumble their meat literally in a tub of spices, and so so every surface is covered. So I'm cooking these pork butts at 225 degrees Fahrenheit until the internal meat temperature reaches 165. And at that point, then I will wrap them and, and cook them for a little bit more. Once they're on the smoker, I spray them every hour with apple cider vinegar to keep them moist while they're cooking and enhance the flavor when they're done. And yes, there are four pork butts on the smoker. We are not eating all of those tonight. We will probably eat one to one and a half of these and then the rest will go in the freezer for a later date. It's just easier when I have the smoker going to to fill it up and, and cook as, as much as I can. After Cam got the pork started, I got started on making the homemade tortillas. We decided to make flour tortillas and we are using some of the lard we made earlier this year. This is a simple recipe that uses all-purpose flour, salt, baking powder, lard, and you mix that together and then you add hot water. Once I got it all mixed together, I weighed the dough and then divided that by 20 because I actually made a double batch of this. We eat a lot and we like to eat it for leftovers. I formed each of those pieces into dough balls and then you kind of flatten them out a little bit on the counter. And as I was doing this, I got a kitchen towel and I got it wet and then wrung it out so it was nice and damp for on top of these tortillas. Then I let it rest for 45 minutes. Fast forward a few hours and I'm now putting the temperature probes in the meat because they're getting close to when I will wrap them. As I mentioned before, once the temperature reaches 165, at that point I wrap them and put them back on the smoker until they reach to between 205 and 210. And at that point they're done because the fat at, at that temperature has had time to render and the meat fibers have become loose enough that you can pull them apart easily and it truly becomes pulled pork. While I'm waiting for the meat to finish up, I quickly pickled some vegetables. I julienne some cucumbers and carrots and put them in a quick brine. It was basically water, vinegar, sugar, salt, and I think a few spices. And then we threw that in a jar, let it sit on the counter for one to two hours, basically until dinner was ready to eat. Okay, now the meat's done. I wish you could smell it because it smells so good. So I take the meat off the smoker, let it rest for an hour, and then it's ready to unwrap, pull apart, and serve. That's, yeah, that's good stuff. Oh. Oh, okay, now it's getting hot, yeah. Use your forks. I know, I need to break it up just like a little bit more, and then I'll use my fork, okay? So to put this together, we add a homemade tortilla, smoked pulled pork, the pickled cucumbers, pickled carrots, cilantro, arugula, and then a squeeze of lime juice and some sour cream, and then we roll it up and eat it. The next meal is definitely a summer favorite. It's non bread, preserved lemon hummus, and a Greek salad. So to start out, Cam is making the dough for the naan bread. This is his specialty because he can use our pizza oven to make a really fluffy dough and it has some great flavor. It always turns out really well.
<laughs> that one got cooked. Sorry, don't show that one. Show that side. The night prior to making this, I had soaked some chickpeas for the hummus, and I also use them in the Greek salad. My favorite easy way to cook chickpeas is in our pressure cooker. For hummus, I usually do a longer cook time. It's about 22 minutes because it makes the chickpeas softer and they have a better texture for hummus. And I was also killing two birds with one stone here and cooking chickpeas to use for the salad too. Too, and usually if I were just to cook them for the salad, I would do them for a lot less time, but because I was doing both, I cooked them for the longer time. So they were a little soft in the salad, but it honestly wasn't a big deal. It still tasted good. Adding preserved lemons to hummus is a definite game changer. If you haven't tried it, you need to try this. I have my recipe for preserved lemons and the hummus linked down below, and it is one of my very favorite things. When it comes to making hummus, another thing that tastes so good is when you make your own homemade tahini. I get the brown sesame seeds from Azure Standard and then I turn them into a seed butter in my food processor and I keep that in the refrigerator for when I need to make the hummus. So I make a big batch and then I just use a little bit at a time. I think it would be fine stored at room temperature, but I just want it to last a long time so it ends up in the refrigerator. Before I start to chop all of the veggies for the Greek salad, I go ahead and make the dressing. You can probably see a trend here. I always make my dressing a little bit in advance so it has time to kind of sit and the flavors meld together before we add it to the dish when we are finished. working on this dinner together as a family and when it came time to put together the Greek salad, Cruz decided that he wanted to help with that part and so he added his own commentary here. Yum. I can't see this. But I'm breaking up the feather so that it's not big when you eat it. Mmm, scrumptious. It's okay. Wow, that's where those tomatoes went. They were underneath all the cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on, let's retry that. So here is the finished dinner. It turned out really good and tasty. Yeah, handsomely. He's made food. For this dinner, I am making grain bowls. Grain bowls are a super adaptable dish that we like to eat often. This is a use what you have sort of meal, whatever is fresh and in season from the garden or the farmer's market, use it. The formula is very simple. Usually we add grain as a base and then some kind of marinated meat. If you are like vegan or vegetarian, you could use tofu instead. And then I add seasonal vegetables and a dressing. What I used on this day was marinated chicken. And then I added three cups of brown sprouted rice to my pressure cooker and I add water and salt. And since the rice is sprouted, it cooks faster so I can use the rice setting on the cooker. While that rice was cooking, I chopped up the vegetables. I added chopped cucumbers and tomatoes and diced red onions, shredded carrots and arugula. Then 
to cook the chicken, I use a large cast iron skillet and pour in a little oil or baking grease on the bottom of the pan. Then I turn the heat on high, add the chicken and cook it for two minutes. Then I flip the chicken, turn the heat down to medium low and cook it for another 10 minutes with the lid on. And then I turn the heat off and keep that lid on and then let it rest and cook for another 10 minutes with the heat off. So as the chicken was cooking, I got started on the dressing. This time I used one cup of sour cream, a cup of mayonnaise, one to one and a half cups of basil leaves, a quarter cup of lemon juice, one cup of Parmesan cheese, and two small garlic cloves. Then I blend it together and set it aside. After that, it's real simple. We chop up the chicken, place everything in containers for serving, and then we each make our own grain bowl. 